Hi, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 1 of Psych 3530. Uh, chapter 1 is titled, Psychology is a Way of Thinking. Um, so this chapter, sort of in a nutshell, is going to uh, walk us through sort of what is research, why is research important, uh, both in this class, but also maybe in your life and to the world. Uh, how, do, how do we do research? Just sort of the very basic structure of asking research questions. Uh, and then we're going to discuss um, a, little bit, a little bit about science journalism and, uh, and why that's important as well. So let's dive right in. Um, from a very practical perspective, um, why does this class matter? Well, first, you need a C in this class and also in 3530, the next course uh, in our research method sequence, in order to graduate with, with a psychology degree. You must get a C if you're going to graduate from Georgia State. Uh, and you cannot move on to 3530 until you get at least a C in this course. Now, um, there is a limit to the number of times you can take this course. You do not have an infinite number of tries, so to speak, uh, to pass this class. Um, I believe the limit is two. Uh, however, you can appeal that and you can take this class a third time uh, if there were uh, maybe unforeseen circumstances that caused you uh, to not get at least a C. From a more general perspective, this class is really important because it's gonna provide you with the skills and knowledge to help you produce research findings potentially. We're gonna, we're gonna lay the foundation, we're gonna lay the groundwork for um, you potentially participating in research as a scientist um, or for a corporation or, or for the government in, in um, your employment. And lastly, perhaps I think maybe most importantly, uh, because this is gonna uh, apply to everyone, even if you don't do research uh, in the future, this class is gonna help provide you with skills and knowledge so that you can be a more informed consumer of research findings. So when we look at the news, um, you know, every day we're sort of bombarded by new research findings, whether that's about, you know, disease or whether it's about the environment or whether it's about nutrition and health or um, child development, right? Whatever it is, there's, there's just tons of research going on in the world. And we can use that research uh, to help inform our lives and to help better our lives. That's what being a good consumer of research means. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that you might need to look out for um, when you're consuming research. Okay. Um, so what do you need to do in order to produce research? Uh, well, very straightforward. You need to be able to design an experiment. This means uh, setting up the world in such a way where you control certain things so that we can study them and then measure them and figure out how to measure the effect of what you have controlled. Uh, and then once you have controlled something about the world and measured it, uh, you need to know which data analyses to run. There are lots of different um, statistical analyses out there. Uh, there's tons of them. Um, we're not going to learn too many of them this semester. We'll learn a few, but this class is really about foundations. Uh, in 3530, that you will learn um, uh, more data analyses. But as a scientist or someone who's collected data, you need to be able to look at your data and tell what analyses to run. And then, of course, you need to be able to draw conclusions from those analyses and ex sort of extrapolate that to the real world uh, so that your work can have impact. So again, uh, many of you are probably thinking, who cares? I'm not gonna be a scientist. I don't wanna be a scientist. Um, well, I think you should care because um, these research skills and these data analytics skills are very valuable in the, in the um, workforce and in, in the open market. Um, so you see here two images on the left is sort of a newly designed Publix. It's nice and modern and sleek and slick. Uh, on the right, you see sort of an, um, an old design of a grocery store. And let's say that you work for corporate Publix and they, they know that on, to, to renovate the average Publix, 
it's going to cost about $20 million. Um, but they want something back from that investment, right? That $20 million is expensive and that's money that Publix could be doing something else with. So they need to know if we invest this $20 million in a store, when do we get it back? How long does it take um, for us to recoup that cost? Uh, additionally, does the new design maybe enhance the sales of certain items? Um, does it enhance uh, maybe people's shopping experience and their ratings of how much they like Publix? Does it change how long people stay in the store? Do people Are people maybe more likely to shop for longer uh, after this um, renovation of a grocery store? All of these are research questions, right? This is uh, something that a, an, a research scientist or someone with uh, a background in experimental design or statistics can approach these questions and answer them for Publix and Publix will pay you handsomely to do so if you have those skills. Uh, data rules the world, especially in the age of online shopping. So you can imagine that there are whole teams of people at companies like Amazon um, that run maybe algorithms and collect data on uh, things like what items are people aged 20, to, aged 20 to 30 likely to purchase if they also bought an office chair? Because if Amazon knows that you bought an office chair and they know that, for example, you're also likely to buy a computer or a microphone uh, or a headset right? or pens or printer paper, right? If you've bought an office chair, that's valuable information. And there are people whose job it is to answer those questions, right? If you buy an office chair, what else are you likely to buy? And again, uh, a company like Amazon will pay you handsomely if you know how to answer these questions and manage uh, these data. Lastly, uh, let's imagine something different. Let's say you're a school counselor. Um, so your job doesn't necessarily involve data collection or research per se, but you need to be a good consumer of research so that you can make decisions about what to do in your job. Uh, let's imagine that um, your principal says, um, hey, you know, we, we got this $10,000 grant um, that is supposed to go towards something in your office, the counseling office, to create a program for children. So here's $10,000, right? What do you want to do with it? Um, in order to answer that question well and appropriately, you should be looking at research to inform your decision about how best to spend that $10,000 on a new program. Uh, and so maybe you find a research study that says children of single parent families uh, greatly benefit from mindfulness meditation. And so you tell your principal, you know, I want to spend the $10,000 on maybe training or hiring someone who can do like after school mindfulness meditation with children. And we can really target children of single parent families. Um, and your principal says, well, why do you want to do that? And you can say, I, I want to do that because research has shown that it it's beneficial. And you can maybe break down this research study. Um, you can discuss its findings. You can discuss its results, its methods uh, in order to back up your claim uh, and then hopefully implement a, a successful and helpful evidence-based program in your school rather than just taking the $10,000 and doing something random with it, right? Um, just, you know, sort of pulling something out of, out of thin air go, and say, well, um, you know, nap time is good. So we're going to spend $10,000 buying bedrolls for all the kids. Um, you, instead of just sort of like assuming that that is a good thing, uh, you can actually approach the, the question of what to do with that money and what program, program to implement from an evidence-based perspective, um, and you can use these research method skills in order to understand the research. So um, just sort of as a little summary, um, you know, many professions in the modern economy require the ability to either engage in or interpret science. Um, science sort of broadly construed, uh, maybe, maybe instead of science, 
the word research would be a, a better word here. Um, in fact, if I could give all of you um, one tip about um, the workforce and your education, it would be to learn statistics. Uh, if you have a firm grasp of complex statistics, um, as many psychologists do, they're in fact, um, psychologists are often, uh, aside from statisticians, the, some of the world's best trained statisticians, that if you have those quanti quantitative skills, you're going to, to find a job, you're going to be valuable, you're going to be marketable. It is one of the most valuable things that you can do in the modern economy is be able to, to collect, handle and analyze data. Uh, data rules the world now. Um, so what you should really be doing is using this course as an opportunity to, to lay some of those foundations um, for skills and knowledge that can put you ahead of the pack. Um, I've had people after taking this course, you know, change their major to statistics or, or add a, a minor or decide to go get a master's degree in data analytics. Um, and they are very, very successful. Okay. So let's dig into the chapter. Uh, we're going to discuss what it means to be a producer and a, or a consumer of research. We're going to uh, very generally talk about how scientists approach their work. Uh, we're going to discuss the relationship between theories, data, and hypotheses. Sorry, one second here. Um, oh, I think that made it worse. That's a little better. That glare is kind of annoying me. Um, we're going to discuss the difference between applied and basic research problems. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the process of publication of research as well as science journalism. Okay. So um, why is the producer role of research important? Well, on one hand, you need it for your coursework in psychology to graduate. Um, psychology is a is a science. Um, it is uh, founded on scientific principles. We we often, uh, when you hear about psychology in the in sort of the real world, um, people are almost always talking about like therapy, right, or counseling. That's what most people think psychology is, and psychology is that. Uh, but psychology is also experimental psychology, which is uh, being a scientist trying to learn something about humans and human psychology, whether that's a cognitive psychologist who might study memory, whether it's a social psychologist who might study uh, intimate partner relationships or, or personality, um, whether it's an industrial organizational psychologist who studies people in the workplace, um, uh, psychology itself is founded on research, on going out and asking and answering questions uh, about the human condition. Um, you'll need these producer skills if you plan on going to graduate school. Um, if, you are, uh, if you are in a uh, master's or a PhD program that requires a thesis or a dissertation, you will have to collect data. You will have to go out and be a researcher in order to graduate with that degree. Um, this producer role might be important to you if you're gonna get experience working in a research lab, uh, either as a, a student volunteering uh, or as, as, as employment. Um, many large research labs employ lab managers as a, a, a salaried position. And uh, those people typically have either a bachelor's or a master's degree in psychology and they just sort of oversee the day-to-day -day operation of a research lab. And of course, as we've discussed, um, this producer role uh, can be involved in answering questions for corporations as, uh, as your employer. So why is the consumer role important? Um, again, for your psychology courses, you're gonna need to be able to consume research because that's how you learn things about psychology or any other science you need to be able to um, uh, consume appropriately and effectively and efficiently uh, what we call uh, you know, original material. So uh, um, original published research findings. 
Uh, and in fact, in this class, we're going to get some practice doing that. You have uh, a group of assignments called article analyses that uh, you will have to read an actual published research finding from a, from a professional academic journal publication. Uh, and then you're going to have to answer questions about it and sort of break it down um, and analyze it. So consuming uh, research is also really important if you're um, reading um, news that's based on research. Uh, you might not always want to take the, um, the interpretation of the news source at, uh, as sort of the word of God. Um, uh, that's, you know, uh, an issue in science journalism is, is how can you tell um, what science journalism to trust and what science journalism not to trust? Well, part of it would be that you can go read the actual published research, the original source material. Um, and if you can do that, then then you can be an even more effective consumer of uh, news that's based on research. And uh, as we discussed earlier with the example of a school counselor, uh, you might find yourself in a career where you need to be using evidence-based treatments like the school counselor, right? The school counselor with the $10,000 grant um, shouldn't just do whatever they want randomly with that money. They should uh, base that decision on evidence and what treatments um, have been found to work or not work uh, with the target population. So, um, this sort of begs the question, what is evidence-based treatment? Uh, it seems simple, right? Uh, it's treatment or therapies based upon experimental evidence from a scientist. Uh, sounds really straightforward. Um, however, in society, people often have a difficult time parsing out um, evidence-based treatments versus, frankly, bullshit, right? Things that are either made up are done incorrectly, um, or are explicitly trying to fool you uh, or manipulate you. So it, it seems simple, but people fall into these traps of, uh, of trusting non-evidence-based treatments, and the, the, um, the outcomes can be quite scary and, and quite traumatic. Uh, so here are two good examples. Um, this headline is real. It's from the Washington Post. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, who is a terrible, terrible, disgusting human being. She is a charlatan, and she tries to profit off of the ignorance of other people. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop, that's a company she owns, touted the benefits of putting a jade egg in your vagina. I'm not making that up. Um, they sold a multiple hundred million dollar, a hundred million, a multiple uh hundred dollar jade egg uh and they were telling women to put it into their vagina uh to help with health um if that seems stupid it's because it is it is very stupid there are no benefits of putting a jade egg into your vagina uh and gwyneth paltrow's company lied about it and they claimed that there was evidence based that this was an evidence-based treatment but it was not uh and they got sued uh, and they had to pay. So in short, Gwyneth Paltrow is an asshole. Um, and then here at the bottom, unfortunately, um, a, another example of people um, not trusting evidence-based treatments or trusting non-evidence-based treatments, um, because of misinformation and fear around things like vaccines in uh, Western Europe and the United States, uh, we are seeing the return of basically once eradicated diseases like mumps. Um, we don't, there's no reason why anyone in the United States should have mumps. We have a vaccine um, and it works and it's effective and it's safe, uh, but people don't want to believe that for any number of reasons. Uh, and so people are not vaccinating their children um, and we are seeing the return of eradicated diseases, which are terrible terrible diseases. Um, why this is happening, uh, I mean, we could, I could probably teach an entire semester class just on, um, you know, the psychology of why people don't um, trust vaccines or why some people don't trust vaccines anymore. Uh, it's really, really complicated. Um, 
you know, part of it is misinformation. Part of it is lies. Part of it is wrapped up in this, this sort of idea of like natural and things that are natural are better and that vaccines aren't natural, uh, which is just a bunch of bullshit. Um, you know, as well as part, I think part of the problem is that, um, you know, if you're a 30 something, 40 something adult who's having children today, you know, you've never met anyone who's had mumps or polio. It, it's, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. It seems like, well, you know, no one dies of polio. Um, it, it's not that big. It, it can't be serious. It's not that big of a deal. We don't need to get the vaccine. Well, no one dies of polio because we created a vaccine that allows people to not get polio. That's why it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, because the vaccines work. Okay. Um, and what is the benefit of being a good consumer? I want you all maybe to take a second and think maybe in your own life or the lives of others, um, what benefit can come from being a critical good consumer of research and information? Like what, what do you get from that? Why is it a positive thing either for yourself or for the world? Um, so take a second and think about it, maybe hit pause and see if you can come up with a couple interesting ideas. Okay, I hope you're back. I hope you actually did that. If not, shame on you. Um, what do we gain from being a good consumer of research? You gain the ability to use science uh, effectively in your own life and in the lives of others, whether that's personal or professional, right? You can, um, you can read the science on exercise and diet and nutrition and change your life and become healthier. Uh, and live longer and be happier, right? You can you can take this research that exists out in the world, and you can you can really use it to effectively uh, benefit yourself and others. Um, you know, we can think about this in in many domains. You know, if you have children or you're going to have children, um, you might want to read some of the research on on issues in parenting, right? Uh, on on things like time out or spanking. Uh, the research on spanking basically s says not to do it. Um, it's either neutral or it's negative. There, there are no uh, demonstrable positives uh, to child behavior of spanking. Things like that, you, that you can, if you are a good consumer of research and you have these skills, you can go out and find information and critique it and draw conclusions from it and then um, use those conclusions in your everyday life. Okay, so um, I'll give me one second here. Yeah, this is a good place to stop um, and uh, and cut this lecture in half. So so um, we'll have part one, and then we'll pick up um, with part two right here with how scientists approach their work, and we'll finish up um, this uh, lecture in part two. So thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.